The, the number one thing is, is so obvious, it's... Hi again and welcome to another episode of the Law of Business Podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs that can help you to start and grow your business. I'm Jamil Jamma and today we have a real, a really, really awesome guest, Jason McDonald. And in this interview, we're going to be talking about SEO, search engine optimization, social media marketing, all aspects of social media marketing like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, plus content marketing and strategy. We're also going to be talking about AdWords advertising and other forms of digital advertising and marketing for small business owners as well. And Jason McDonald teaches business owners the art and science of getting anything to the top of search engines. Director of the JM Internet Group, this brilliant SEO and digital marketing expert is author to the popular Amazon bestseller digital marketing books, SEO fitness workbook, social media marketing workbook and AdWords workbook. In 1994, before digital marketing was even a thing, Jason started his own technology blog focused on the domain eg3.com, reaching over 50,000 subscribers within the embedded systems engineering community worldwide. Today, through teaching digital marketing courses and corporate workshops, Jason pursues his passion of taking complex topics and making them easy to understand and practical for small business marketers. So it's a real pleasure to have Jason McDonald on the show. Jason, how's it going? Great. I'm really excited to be here. Excited to have you here, Jason. So, Jason, um, where are you based? You're based in uh, California, right? Yes, in California. Yeah, I'm in London, as I told you earlier. And um, is it really early for you? Yeah, it's 8 in the morning. Okay, awesome. So, are you an early bird? Do you wake up at 4 a.m.? No, I'm not a early bird, but I usually wake up about six and then I usually write for about an hour and a half. So I'm working on a couple of books. I'm always working on a book and I usually, um, you know, write in the morning. I find that's my best, my best time to write. Mm. And you've, uh, some, some of your books are about SEO marketing, is it? For Google, isn't it? Yeah, that's my first book that was really quite successful, uh, was on search engine optimization, which is, you know, essentially how to influence uh, search engines like Google or Bing, and that grew out of my course at Stanford Continuing Studies. So that was my first book that I really thought, hey, you know, a lot of people probably want to know about this, and let me write it up and try to organize it. You know, it's very confusing, so if you organize it, I find people really, you know, they appreciate kind of a systematic step-by-step. Hmm. But before all, all, all your books, uh, Jason, before you wrote all your books, um, can you tell us your backstory, please, from when you started to be an entrepreneur to where you are right now? Yeah, 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 sure. So I, uh, believe it or not, I have a PhD from UC Berkeley. So I'm a kind of a recover. I'm saying myself as a recovering academic. So in 92, I got my PhD. I started a life crisis. 92, I had my PhD. I broke up with my girlfriend. It was like, what am I going to do with my life? And I, I really, I loved being a graduate student. I, I lived in Europe for a while. I just it really, really loved it. But then I was like, oh, I don't really want to be a professor. Or the, you know, it's, it's not just not my thing for a whole bunch of reasons. And you know, this was way back in the day, and there was a huge tech boom. You know, in the nineties, it was very boom and bust here in Silicon Valley. So I started working at uh, a media company in San Jose, and we were working with. Um, it was, I was very fortunate as an electronic Im- embedded systems engineer, so it was very, very, very techy. And we were working for Intel and Motorola and whatnot. And we were producing trade shows and catalogs and print brochures and magazines for these big semiconductor vendors. And that was right when the internet started, right in 94. And so that's how I got interested in the internet aspect. And then, you know, it's funny how careers work. A lot of the knowledge that I got from Berkeley was very useful, like how do computers work, how does data work, how does information flow. A lot of the things I learned as a PhD student were very helpful, and that's how I got into it, was in this very techie community in the early 90s. So one of the very first early adopters of the internet were, of course, the, the techies, and that's how I got started in it. And that was in the early 90s, that was 1994, yeah? So that, that, was, before, that was before Google. 
way before Google. Yeah, I actually have a Google towel because in 1999, they came and we were one of the first advertisers on Google in 99. And they, and this is, you know, Google was just starting and we were in, in the Bay Area. And so they came to our office and schmoozed us about being an advertiser. This was way before it got all systemat systematic and computerized. And uh, so yeah, I was one of the very first advertisers on Google. So did you, did you meet the Google guys? Uh, believe it or not, I forgot their names because they're not, they're not really celebrities, are they? They keep a lot of problems. Not so much. Larry and then, uh, yeah, no, Larry and Sergey, no. No, no, no. I met the ad reps and I'm not that quite, not that famous, but the ad reps at the time and, and whatnot. And for the fun fact, they came out and we were bidding on embedded systems words like single board computer. And I talked to this woman who came out from Google and I was like, you know, what are the hot words? What are the key words that people really want? And at this point in time, this is like 1999, she said, we kind of have two divisions at Google. We have the sex division, which controls the sex keywords, and we have the tech division which works on the tech keywords. And I was like, oh, you're, you're lucky, you work in the classy division. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> so um, Jason, um, what is the number one thing a small business owner can do to get to the top of Google? The, the number one thing is, is so obvious, it's know your keywords and, and put them on your homepage. If you wanna rank for you know, Hair Transplant London, put Hair Transplant London, those words, on your homepage. And, and it's so obvious, but I can't tell you how many businesses will tell me, you know, oh, I want to rank for industrial fans or something like that. And then you look at their homepage and nowhere on the homepage does it actually mention the keyword that they want to rank for. Hmm. Obvious, but, right? Yeah, yeah, that is obvious. I never thought of that, but that, that is obvious. I, I do that. I do that with my website. <laughs> so, I, so I do know that. Um, yeah, that's the it's the most important thing. Now, there's all sorts of derivations, like getting in the right tag structure and cross-linking it and image alts and all of this content stuff and, and building links and on and on and on, you know, down the rabbit hole. Uh, but that's the most important. And, and it kind of one of the more important counterintuitive things there is the city names, right? So many, many businesses are local, right? So there are a, a local pizza restaurant in Palo Alto, right? And they, they'll just kind of think, well, we're in Palo Alto. Everyone knows we're in Palo Alto. And they won't put the words Palo Alto on their homepage. That's another really obvious uh, um, thing that people miss. The, the same, I'm guessing the same, the same rule applies for uh, Bing and Yahoo as well, right? Yeah. So the game of SEO is very similar. And, of course, Google has like 85 90% market share. And, you know, Bing and Yahoo essentially follow. You don't usually have to do much differently for them. Uh, interestingly enough, I would probably argue that the most important search engines are not Google and Bing, but Google and YouTube, and really Google and Amazon. So anyone who's selling products, you know, Amazon is a search engine, and uh, you know, obviously a, a direct seller, uh, and it's it's really more important than Bing. So I'd say it's Google, Amazon, YouTube, and then Bing and Yahoo are so they just follow Google. They're they're, they're the same search engine, to be honest. Mm, so there's no point learning Bing and Yahoo because I, I was going to learn SEO. No. I wanted to learn Google, and then I wanted to learn Bing and Yahoo, but I started thinking there's no point learning Bing and Yahoo since Google. They're not really different. There really is no real substantive difference between them. I mean, Google is, um, or Bing rather, is a little bit more sensitive to keywords in the domain name and keywords in the URLs and whatnot, and, and Google does a far better job with sort of link analysis. But generally speaking, if you rank on Google, you'll rank on Bing. Hmm. Are, are reviews good for ranking as well? Yes. So this is, a, you know, kind of a, a very important point, again, for local businesses. So whenever you're working on SEO, it's right, you've got to audit, like, what, what kind of business are you? Are you a local business? Are you e-commerce? Are you a consumer business, you know, that's very trendy? Or are you B2B, et cetera? So you've got to kind of audit, like, what kind of business are you? You've got to look into your entrepreneurial soul and say, well, what, what, what do we do and who, who do we reach, right? And then if you're local, especially if you're local, right? So take a very obvious example, pizza, right? Just go to Google right now and type in pizza and you're going to see what's called the snack pack or the local pack, which is this three box set of businesses, right? Well, you'll look at that and you're going to see, you know, surprise, surprise, you're going to see Google reviews. Well, think like Google. I mean, if it's, you know, who should rank for Pizza Palo Alto? It's the vendor that has the most reviews, essentially, right? So as a vendor, if you sell pizza, you've got to get your review count up. You've got to ask your customers, hey, do us a favor, write a review. The review count on Google is tremendously important for a local business. Now, on Bing, right, 
that is really driven by Yelp reviews. So Yelp reviews drive Bing and Google reviews drive Google. And then you'll also see Yelp often on Google. So for local reviews are critical and you've got to influence those reviews in, in your direction, both, both quantity and quality. Hmm. So um, how do online reviews impact a business, both online and, and off? Oh, they're incredible. So again, it's all about an audit, right? So if you're, uh, let's say you take them in not local, like in industrial fans, and I teach the class at Stanford, I have sort of stock examples. So if you go to Google and you put in industrial fans, there's no local aspect to it. So in that situation, the review count is not that important. But if you put in pizza or massage therapist or divorce attorney, you know, you're going to see those um, local reviews. Now, how can they help? The more reviews you have, the more you rank at the top of Google. The more you rank at the top of Google, the more customers you get. The more customers you get, the more reviews you get. You get what's called a virtuous circle. So a virtuous circle, you know, is going in your direction as a business. Now, there's also a vicious circle. That is, you go to Google, you, you, you Google a, a company, you see that they have a negative review or a couple negative reviews. And this is terrible pizza. I hate it. I don't eat here. You know, it's just nasty. Then what happens? No one will come to your restaurant. They won't even try you because they'll read the review that's negative. So a, a few negative reviews can be devastating uh, to a business. And many positive reviews can be very, very helpful. Uh, you know, so they're, they're both really positive or super negative. And you, as a business owner, if, if your views are at work in your market, you have to pay attention to them and you've really got to put them as a very, very critical uh, component. You, you've got to focus on them. Definitely. Cause whenever, before I buy a product, I'll, I always check out the reviews. Exactly. And, and that's a good example too, where Amazon, right. Which is, you know, number really number two search engine for products, right. Uh, has reviews and Amazon reviews are critical as well. So if you play on Amazon, it's like, it's kind of like a board game. Like what, where do you play? Do you play on Amazon? Do you play on Google? Do you play on Yelp? You know, do you play on Airbnb, right? There are different kind of search engines that are out there. Uh, in, in that case, then reviews really matter. If you're trying to, you know, to rent a, a, a flat in London, you know, on Airbnb, the reviews are incredibly important on Airbnb. So the reviews are not always on Google. They can be on these niche search engines you know, like Airbnb and they're, and they're critical. What, what about Facebook as well? Cause uh, the largest search engine is um, Google. Second it's um, YouTube, which is owned mm. by Google. Uh, mm. But what about Facebook as well? Cause Facebook, Facebook is still big. Yes. So this is a kind of, I would say that you're kind of crossing the Rubicon here. So Facebook has reviews. There are reviews of a local business on Facebook, but by and large, Facebook is what I call the share path and Google is the search path. So Google, you know, if I'm, I'm hungry, go to, you know, go to Google, type in pizza, find a pizza restaurant, off I go. Uh, you don't really do that on Facebook. You don't really go into Facebook and use it like a search engine, right? So Facebook doesn't have what I call a search path. It has a share path. And, and that means, you know, my friends are at a pizza restaurant. They take a selfie. They're having a great time. And then I see it and I go, oh, that looks cool. I want to go there too. So Facebook is very complementary to Google. It's not competitive, it's complementary. And it's about people sharing information uh, of you know, products and services that they like. Now, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, right, the epiphany is to realize you can influence this. You, know, you can say to people in your pizza joint, hey, we're having a contest, best selfie. Best selfie gets you know, a free pizza once a week or whatever, and you can incentivize people to share you know, on Instagram, on Facebook. So you can also influence these things in a positive direction for your so business. Facebook. So Facebook is, is um, for ads, for advertising, isn't it? Yeah, and ads on Facebook are very good. Again, again, more on this sort of, I'm not looking for it, but a look at this. So Facebook is more a discovery channel for kind of people who are not proactively looking for your product, right? So you, you'd advertise on Facebook, you know, a new line of swimsuits that people aren't necessarily looking for, but then they see it and they go, oh, I, I did a project once with uh, self, uh, uh, they're called like self tanning swimsuits. So the fabric is in such a way that, you know, you can tan through the swimsuit, right? And, and people don't proactively go, oh, I, I just happen to need a nude swimsuit, right? But it's great for Facebook because it's a good way to advertise and push it in front of people who, who then think, oh, look, I can get rid of my tan line. Who knew? Mm. Are Facebook ads worth it? They are, again, it, you've got to think of what your purpose is. So I would say in general, for most businesses, for most uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses, 
ads on Google are better. And, and that's because of intent. So when somebody goes to Google and they put an accountant, they're looking for an accountant. They're ready to buy their for prime. So if there's an intent path, a search path, Google ads will usually way outperform Facebook ads. Facebook ads are good when you want to demographically target. So take swimsuits, right? So you want to target women who are aged, you know, 20 to 24 and they live in New York City and you want to target it in the summer or the early spring or something. Facebook is great for this demographic targeting where they're not necessarily looking for what you have, but you kind of fit the target, you know, and you can, you can slice and dice them in a million ways on Facebook and, and that's where it's good. So it's like, you know, it's complementary to Google. It's not competitive uh, to Google in your marketing mix. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, there was a face Facebook was on a news recently. Was it like a month ago or was it, was it two months ago? I don't know. Time's flying. Mark Facebook, Zuckerberg was on a news recently. For, yeah, Facebook has been in a lot of hot water over, you know, the so-called uh, manipulation of the election with the Russians and the chatbots and, uh, you know, the sharing of information. So, you know, Facebook knows a lot about all of us. We kind of give our information to Facebook sort of willy nilly. Uh, and then they've kind of been caught with their pants down about being very loose with our data and, and, and loose with their advertising system. So they've had a lot of bad press uh, about this. And uh, to be honest, I think they're, they're kind of behind the curve on, on dealing with these problems. Mm. Was it, was it real news or was it, was it fake news? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's real news that Facebook has been very loose with user data and has not done a good job um, with, with user data. I, I think the whole, you know, Russian hacking of the election, all this jazz, just looking at the Facebook thing, you know, the, the media is so funny. They said, Oh my goodness. Uh, people spend $100,000 on Facebook ads, you know, to influence the U.S. election. And that sounds like a lot of money, but I have clients that spend $100,000 on Facebook ads, you know, in a month, right? So it's like, it's certainly not that much money. So I think some of it was overhyped by the media, but I, I do think the data break breaches are a problem on Facebook and they have not done a good job with this. Mm. So what are the roots of fake news and how does this tell us how everything is marketed? Yeah, so it's funny with fake news, so-called fake news. Um, it's really interesting. So what, you know, the whole fake news scandal, what it really tells us as advertisers, as marketers ourselves uh, on social, on Facebook, on Instagram, et cetera, you know, number one, it tells us you can demographically target people and you can be very, very focused. You can say, I want to target people who are 20 to 35, who are male, who live in the Bay Area, who like dogs. You can really target. And that's a very powerful feature uh, on Facebook. That's one thing it tells us as marketers that the, the targeting is unbelievable on Facebook. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing I think it tells us is emotions. Most of these ads that were allegedly influencing our election, they were very emotional ads. So they weren't like factual, like here are the facts. They were just like, you know, can, can you believe it? Oh my goodness. A very visual sort of emotional. You see this with the border crisis that a lot of the things that are really getting people fired up are these emotional talking points that are not necessarily accurate. They're a little bit off, right? And then the third thing I think that the Facebook uh, fake news tells us as marketers, you know, is that people don't necessarily do their homework. I mean, they just sort of look at something and off they go. They don't really dig deeply. So I don't want to be completely Machiavellian, but as a, as a marketer, you know, you can target very effectively on Facebook, right? You can use emotion very effectively on Facebook. And really, you don't have to substantiate all your claims uh, in, in terms of. So in that way, I mean, I don't want to be a cynic, but it's a very exciting, it's a very exciting medium as a marketer because there's a lot you can do with it. And I think that's what the whole fake news scandal tells us is you know, just marketing swimsuits. That there's a lot of opportunity uh, on Facebook in that way. Mm. The news was saying, it was real news, the news was saying Facebook knows a lot about us, but Google knows way more about us than Facebook does, don't they? They know different things. They know different things. So this is very interesting. So Facebook knows a lot because of who you talk to, who you like, what businesses you like. So Facebook knows a lot of demographic information about you, your sex, your age, uh, do you like dogs, do you like cats, do you shop at Whole Foods, you know, this kind of stuff. So Facebook has a real treasure trove of kind of passive information about who you are as a person and what demographic categories you fit into. Google knows a lot about intent, 
right? So let's take shopping for a car. You don't necessarily know from someone's demographics, are they shopping for a car? You don't really know that. But Google, because you're searching on Google, you start searching, you know, Toyotas and Lexus and, you know, you know whatever, right? Uh, Teslas, you start searching. Google knows you're in that moment, you're what's called in the market for cars. So Google knows much more about our intent and kind of where we are on the search curves and Google knows, or Facebook knows much more about demographics. Again, they're very complementary marketing channels. Does that help with doing Google AdWords? Yeah so, yeah, so again, AdWords are really, really excellent when there's intent, right? So when you're shopping for a car, you will start to search, you know, cars for sale, Toyotas for sale, this Toyota model, that Toyota model. AdWords ads are excellent for intent, right? Facebook ads are really good for demographics. So I'm going to target women who are age 18 to 24, and I'm going to sell them swimsuits because that's that like swimsuit demographic, right? Those are the people who really buy swimsuits. So, so they're complementary um, uh, in this way. Now, it's interesting. Google has a product called the Google Display Network, which is more really like Facebook ads. They don't work particularly well. So I generally, for beginners, I generally recommend that you do not use the Google Display Network. It's not particularly good, but it's attempt, it's an attempt by Google to sort of replicate uh, what works so well on Facebook. Which they're struggling to do. Yeah, they're struggling. They're, you know, they're, they're the, you know, sort of like all these Silicon Valley companies, right? You know, Google is the killer search engine and they've nailed that and it's, it's got kind of a quasi monopoly about search. And Facebook has sort of nailed the social with, especially with their ownership of Instagram and Facebook Messenger and whatnot. So they've really nailed the social, but Facebook has no search engine component, no intent based advertising. And Google has really no demographic advertising that's very good. So they're, yeah. they're, they're completely like two ships passing in the night. And that's why I think people confuse them. They think of them as competitive and they're not competitive. They're different animals. Mm. There's a quote. I, I, I can't remember the exact quote. If you try to be a jack of all trades, um, you're going to be, or if you, if you try to juggle something, basically if you try to be a jack of all trades, you'll be a trade of none. Something yeah, like I've always heard that as a Nigerian proverb, that the man who goes after two mice catches none. Yeah, that's, that's, so that's why Google failed with trying to copy Facebook. Yeah, Google but, uh, Plus was pretty much a failure. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that Google, Google Plus was a failure as well. So um, what are some gotchas lurking in Google AdWords that can cost you uh, money? Sure. So if you're advertising in AdWords, so I always start with like the business, like, okay, we're doing pizza and we're going to go after intent. So people are going to search for pizza, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you've got to figure out what kind of business you are first. That's the most important thing. And then there are various gotchas. So one gotcha I've mentioned already is what's called the Google Display Network or GDN. And these are ads on blogs and YouTube and whatnot. And, and Google's done just a horrendous job setting this up. Uh, there's a lot of fraud on the Google Display Network, a lot of uh, fraud and click problems, and Google just has not done a very honest um, job policing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very unhappy as somebody who manages ads with the way the Display Network works. Uh, so a gotcha is, you know, Google will lead you into running on the Display Network if, if you're not careful. So you want to opt out. You don't want to run on the, the GD on the Display Network. Uh, as a beginner, it's just you'll just lose a, a ton of money. So that's a gotcha. That's a huge problem for people. Uh, and second, really important gotcha on AdWords is what's called the keyword match types. Uh, so in my book on AdWords, you can find that on Amazon, of course. Um, it's the nomenclature. So when you advertise on pizza, if you just put in the word pizza with no quotes, no plus signs, whatever, uh, Google will run with that and they'll say, you know, essentially, well, pizza, pizza is like Italian, Italian food is like Greek food. And before you know it, you're running on Greek food as a search term and not pizza. So you want to put a plus sign, a bracket or a quote uh, in front of your keywords. So that, that's a huge problem inside of AdWords. And, and you know, I, I don't want to be too cynical here, but Google has kind of rigged this in such a way that you don't really understand it. You'll just you'll just waste money. So those are two really important gotchas. Uh, and talking about your books, Jason, and how many books have you authored so far? Probably about 10, but I think three are really have been quite successful. So the SEO book, the AdWords book, and the social media book um, are the ones that have been, you know, very successful. But I actually wrote a book on Donald Trump after the election, which 
which flopped, but it was, I was just so fascinated by Trump and how he was using social media. Uh, and then I actually have a book on password security as well, though, so I not, have not done well, but I'm, sometimes you write a book just because you want to learn the topic. You want to learn, oh, how does this work, you know? And then um, that, but the main ones are the SEO, social media, and AdWords workbooks. Mm. I never thought of that part of password security. I never thought somebody could write a book on it, but you did. Yeah, you know, right, because uh, my parents are in their 80s, and I just got so disgusted at how much manipulation is on the internet. And if in a lot of uh, scams, right, I love, you know, marketing is, you know, scams are marketing. You know, when they call you and they say, hey, the IRS is coming to your house to, you know, arrest you and you owe us money, you know, they're essentially marketing to you a, a quote, product, quote, you know, you better pay up. So the, the scam aspect is what really fascinated me about passwords and, and not the technical part of stealing passwords, but the scam aspect of how you trick people uh, in, in there. And there's a lot of marketing in scams. Scams are marketing. Hmm. So they, they use fear to, to mark, they use fear as marketing. Yeah, they use fear, they use credibility, you know, all, all of this, all this stuff is, is part of a good, um, a, a good scam. Hmm. And Jason, you spend like an hour a day writing your books, right? Yeah, hour, hour and a half. I try to write about an hour, an hour and a half. I'm coming out with a new book on marketing, so I have a, a rough draft of that, and now I'm just going to plug through and, and edit it and get that out. So yeah, about an hour, hour and a half each day so that I you know, just turn off my phone, turn off my Skype, ignore the world, and just try to dig in because if you don't... You grab don't, a coffee. You dedicate the time, you don't, you, know, you don't get it done, yeah. You don't have time to grab a coffee either, do you? No, I, I actually drink a lot of tea. I'm, I'm a super caffeinated person. I'm addicted uh, to caffeine, and I'm more of a tea drinker than a coffee drinker. Awesome, awesome, uh, Jason. Jason, um, um, if, anyone, if anybody wanted to contact you and learn more about you and uh, what you do, where can they uh, find you? Uh, easiest way is just go to Google and put in my name, put in Jason McDonald or Jason McDonald SEO, and I'm at the top of Google for those searches. Or if you go to Amazon and you just put in SEO or social media marketing or AdWords, you'll find my books really easily on Amazon. Because of course, I, I, I manipulated the guys, so I show. So just either Amazon or Google, you, you can find me very easily. Awesome, awesome. And if anybody wants to learn how to rank high on Google, then Jason's the person to, to go to. And um, if you know, uh, to the listeners, if you know anybody that this interview will benefit, please share it with them. Please also let me know what you think in the comment section and subscribe. And I'm Jamil Jamma. This is the Law of Business and I was Jason McDonald's interview. Thank you all very much for listening.